All right, so uh, we'll first uh, quickly go over our introduction and tell you a little bit what we're talking about. So uh, my name is Chris Krugel. I'm uh, the co-founder and chief scientist of LastLine, which is a company that develops breach detection solutions and anti-malware solutions. But I wear other hats as well, and um, I'm also a professor at UC Santa Barbara, and uh, you know, where Jan and a number of other students together with me and Giovanni work on interesting research topics and also on binary analysis and vulnerability finding, which is what the topic of today's talk is. And uh, when we still have a little bit of time, I'm also a member of um, the Shellfish team, which is um, you know, playing in CTF competitions and enjoying binary analysis um, in general for fun. So Jan, I'll just uh, let you introduce before we kick it off. Uh, of course, I'm Jan. Um, I'm a PhD student at UC Santa Barbara, which is an awesome place. Everyone should be a PhD student there, but then it'll be kind of crowded. Um, I'm also part of Shellfish, uh, like Chris, but a slightly newer part. Um, I did lead the uh, Shellfish effort for the DARPA Cyber Grant Challenge. For those that don't know, the Cyber Grant Challenge is an effort to create a fully automated uh, hacking uh, program that can hack, patch, and win CTFs. Um, so that was really fun. We qualified there. I'll talk about it a tiny bit later. And I don't like peanut butter, much to several people's chagrin. So I'll pass it back over to Chris. Yeah, so with this uh, most important bit of our presentation out of the way, uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about firmware and basically embedded software and why, it's an Im why, why is it important to analyze this kind of software? How can we do it? How can we create automated tools that perform binary analysis, analysis of the binaries that power those embedded devices? And then we introduce, or in particular, Jan will introduce Anger. Anger is our platform to perform binary analysis in an automated fashion and it can find uh, a variety of uh, vulnerabilities in firmware, and you know we'll, we'll we'll talk more about how we do this analysis and why it might be interesting for you as well. Okay, so um, just you know to set the stage a little bit, I'm sure you you know all have heard of the Internet of Things and its rapid growth, and what that basically tells us there are more and more devices out there that run embedded software, and uh, those devices and their software is becoming increasingly connected to the Internet, which means more and more people can possibly access that software remotely, and of course finding vulnerabilities allows them to remotely exploit those um, vulnerabilities in embedded software, which you know is is a problem. And of course also uh, this software is often not written with security in mind and um, you, you sort of have a situation almost like Windows in, in, you know, in the late 90s where it's actually fairly easy to find bugs in, in that software. And that is a problem because uh, embedded software is becoming more and more mainstream and is really everywhere and starting not only to you know, be embedded in, in some devices that you might not care about but really devices that you do care about such as you know cars, um, industrial control systems, and of course also a lot of consumer uh, products or things for your house like, uh, like the, the Nest or you know, thermostats. So basically we have this combination of um, potentially vulnerable software that be becomes more and more important, is driving more and more important um, processes and devices, and at the same time um, is often written with not a lot of security in mind and not necessarily easy to update and to patch when vulnerabilities are being found. And of course, that really sets up um, a situation where there could be a lot of security problems and, and that's really the reason why we want to study those and build automated tools to find and ultimately defend against those vulnerabilities. Okay, so how, or rather what are we looking at when I, when I basically talk about embedded devices and firmware? Of course, in, in many cases, sort of these, these embedded devices are just running Linux. You know, it's just a, a scaled down version or some variant of Linux that runs, uh, you know, uses space processes and has the normal operating system kernel. And, uh, you know, that is, is, is more easy to analyze because people are more familiar with it. But when we talk about firmware, we also mean, in particular mean, um, those kinds of firmware that are custom operating systems, scaled down operating systems, some you know, old real-time operating systems maybe, um, with custom programs that are all combined together in what we call a binary blob. So that really means you don't get a familiar environment, you just get a binary blob, some software in binary format, uh, and sometimes it's not easy, easy actually to get this software even off the device, right? Or these devices are running that embedded software, but the question is how can you access it? How can you tr 
translate it to some, some environment where you can actually perform some analysis on top of it. So these are sort of already starting uh, you know, challenges that you face when you perform um, or when you try to perform some kind of analysis on, on this embedded software. Okay, and, and sort of since you're only given the binary, um, what can you do? Well, we, we perform program analysis and in particular we perform binary program or binary code analysis. And the goal is, okay, we want to derive some properties, some interesting um, traits, some interesting behaviors of the software that we are given. And um, they are, you know, just I'll, I'll briefly talk about the two different ways. There are two different ways in general that you can do software um, analysis. And of course, that's also true for binaries. It's static binary analysis or dynamic binary analysis. And um, when, before we dive too much into the details there, let me just remind you of the goal. So we want to perform this analysis. We want to perform binary analysis ultimately to, to find vulnerabilities here. We want to find vulnerabilities. We want to test programs. We want to maybe even verify them. So we want to prove the absence of certain classes of vulnerabilities by analyzing uh, programs. And you know, we might want to generate signatures or defense mechanisms that can constrain inputs that can trigger those vulnerabilities. And of course you can also use it of course when you want to find vulnerabilities you can then write exploits and you know use that same knowledge of course possibly for for not so good purposes. Okay so when we look at the two different um, ways in which you can do the analysis, static or dynamic. Um, when we look at static analysis, it really means you just look at the code, right? So you look at the code, um, you don't execute the program, and you try to reason over all possible program path. So you basically need an analysis that can check out all the possible actions that that program can possibly perform, which which is great because in some sense you can achieve this great coverage. You don't have to try all the path one by one, but you can say meaningful things about the entirety of the program. The problem or the trade-off is that sometimes the things you can say about the entirety of the program are very loose. You might say that program might have a vulnerability. That's not very useful, right? So there is an important trade-off that your know, static analysis needs to be precise enough to not produce these very generic um, yes, there might be a vulnerability on all path. And yes, it's a correct statement, but it's not a very useful statement. So we have to be precise. So when our analysis says, well, there is a vulnerability, we have high confidence that there is actually a vulnerability. But that, on the other hand, has trade-offs with scalability because the more precise you want to be, the more costly your analysis could be and the less scalable it might be to large programs. So that's sort of a challenge that we face. But in principle, static analysis is great because it allows this coverage, this completeness, and, and also, in some sense, verification of programs because it allows you to say, well, we have not found any bug of this class of this kind in all possible program path. In that case, you have actually verified or proven that this program is, is not vulnerable to that kind of vulnerability. So that's great, and it's definitely something that we use, but it has those precision and scalability trade-offs that we'll you know, get much more into later, and, and some ways in which you can combine different analysis to get around the problem that we want to be both scalable and precise enough to find problems. Uh, and of course then sort of the, the counterpart would be dynamic analysis. You just run the program, which means you examine every individual program path, which on each execution is very precise. You know a lot about that particular path. Uh, you know everything about that particular path. But of course the coverage is now hard to achieve because you are in some sense limited on how many of these paths can you execute either you know, in parallel when you farm them out or one after another. Um, and what is particularly interesting also in the, in the realm of firmware, sometimes just running these programs is actually hard because let's say you run them and in principle they would want to interact with some kind of uh, peripheral device, right? Or they, would, they have sensors that read something from the environment. So if you took that blob and you moved it in some kind of environment where you run your analysis, let's say an emulator, then what happens if that program tries to get some sensor readings or tries to actuate some device? How do you react to this? How can you make sure that you get the right, the proper input to the program so that it can actually meaningfully execute? So that's um, a difficult task and, uh, and, and something that is particularly hard on, on binary firmware and not as hard if you, if you would run it on a normal, um, let's say, Linux program. 
Um, there are some ways around this, of course. You can, you can either try to stub and, and try to fake those inputs uh, and try to make the program run, or you can try to offload uh, some system calls, as a system called Avatar does, where you basically have it in an environment where the interaction with the device is offloaded to the real device, and then you get the data back, and then you can continue to analyze it. Um, but there are definitely challenges in both areas, and, and what we do will be a combination of more traditional static program analysis and a combination of dynamic and static analysis, which is called symbolic execution, which Jan will, will go much more into detail. Okay, so we already talked a little bit about the challenges of static binary analysis, hard to get the binary code, but also binaries lack significant information that you would have when you analyze source code. And also you have the problem that often there are no clear operating system or library abstractions. When you perform static analysis on, let's say, a Linux program, and it reads from a file, it would typically either call a library um, that does it, or you know, of course that library in turn calls a system call. And that system call or that library function have a very clear semantics, and typically when you can extract that semantics and you can feed that as input in your program analysis, then your program analysis has sort of an edge, has already some knowledge about what functions or system calls do that you normally don't have when you just get the entire blob and the operating system functions and library functions, they're all meshed together and you don't really have that nice layers of abstraction that can add information to your analysis. Okay, and just you know, to, to quickly run through these challenges, as, as you know, probably most of you know, uh, when you get the source code, you compile it, you link it together, and then you strip any superfluous information out that might not be needed to execute the binary. And when you do that, then things like names, variable and function names, um, of course, are thrown away, but also type information and jump targets for indirect control flow transactions, which you have to now infer back from the binary, even if you want to build a complete control flow graph. So you have to, to perform extra work to reconstruct the control flow graph of the application to understand where are the functions and how they can call each other. You have to extract potential indirect jump targets to be able to get this complete graph. And you have to know something about the types um, of your variables to understand if it's operating on strings or integers or what precision of integers. So there's a lot of work that we had to put into our analysis to recreate, to reconstruct that information, to be even able to just simply say what are the functions and what, what possible calls between functions can occur. Um, I already talked a little bit about the missing OS and library abstractions. Um, as I said, when you have system calls, it's great. You know where the I.O. routines are. Um, and that's very important because in a sense, often when you do vulnerability analysis, you have to assume that the attacker has some ability to send you data, right? Send some input to your program, to your system. And this is a great starting point to do vulnerability analysis because you want to start at where the attacker potentially can provide input so you can follow this input and then understand if the attacker can maybe overflow a buffer later on or influence uh, the execution down the road. If you're looking at a binary blob, we just don't have that information. Um, you might have to reconstruct it based on some interaction where you know, the program might write to certain registers or to certain memory regions, and you have to map that back to I.O. functions. Um, also, of course, if you do the analysis on, let's say, with the Linux system call interface, you get type parameters, you know what the return values mean, and you can focus on a much smaller part, which is the main program. And um, of course, DOS is, is not really there or it's embedded in a binary blob, so we need heuristics to find I.O. functions, which we know are, are possibly incomplete, but we have came up with some. And um, there's an open challenge to be able to find the different components where you can say, here's probably some components that belong to the operating system, and here are components that are probably the main program or the routine that acts on data, is not the supporting functionality. So how can you extract and separate those um, is, is something that is not necessarily trivial. And um, you know, similar arguments apply to library functions, um, especially for those of you who have ever done static analysis. Library functions are great because you actually don't have to analyze them, uh, but rather you can write summary functions that say, okay, I know what string compare does, I know what read does, so I don't have to look at all the code that implements that function, but I can just write a little summary that tells me, or rather the static analysis, what this function will do and in a sort of abstract se semantic summary and that makes the analysis much easier. So now this is gone in the firmware because we don't have the knowledge of what the libraries are. 
It's almost like you know you statically linked it into a binary. So we need to undo this. And um, of course, there are sort of well-known techniques. Ida has Flirt, um, the function library identification recognition technology, which tries to guess what f how functions look like after they've been compiled. We use something fairly similar, but not so much syntactically based on sequence of instructions, but more based on how the control flow of the program looks like, and um, you know, Bindiv style, where you say, okay, there, there's a control flow graph that looks like a particular function that we know is a library function, so we can substitute this function with our summary and don't have to look deeper into it, which you know makes the analysis again faster, more precise, and more scalable. Okay, so. From those challenges, you know, we want to use binary uh, analysis, some variants of static analysis. What kind of vulnerabilities are we looking for? Well, you know, we look for the classic memory safety vulnerabilities, buffer overflows, out of bound reads, you know, the, the, the right what where, sort of the right a value to any location that you can control. So the, the more traditional, um, generic memory corruption vulnerabilities, but also at authentication bypass backdoors, which is harder, as I will talk in, about in a, in a second, because it's more application specific. I mean, a buffer overflow is the same regardless of what application you look at. It's a memory violation that can be specified very cleanly. If you talk about authentication bypass, it's harder because you have to know more about the application, what authentication means in the context of an application, or what it means to be authenticated. So there are, it's harder to model an authentication bypass generically than a memory safety vulnerability. Um, and then there's actuator control. Basically, okay, can an attacker reach certain parts in a program where you can actuate, uh, where you can trigger something that you know, makes things in the real world move? Okay, so I'll, I'll just want to basically give you one motivating example that shows how we detect backdoors or how we model backdoors. Um, it's a simple embedded device. So you have an HTTP server. It's actually, this is not a binary blob, but we'll just give you as a simple example. You know, same thing applies to, to actual binary blobs. And what you have here, someone else found that you basically have a backdoor where you give a certain username and a password that's hard coded in a binary and that allows you to reach authenticated functionality without actually giving a real password. So how would you model that normally? You would say, okay, there's a prompt, the program asks for some user input, then there's authentication routine, and then, you know, depending on the outcome of that authentication, you either reach a success or a failure branch. That makes sense. And so how would you model a backdoor? Well, there's some other path in that program that bypasses the authentication routine, and that could have a string compare or some other check on that input that is different from the normal authentication routine. So that's how traditionally backdoors are modeled. The problem is that in many cases, it's actually hard to find that authentication function if you don't manually reverse engineer the program, which is exactly what we try to avoid with our automated analysis. So how can you work around this? How can you specify an authentication bypass without actually knowing the authentication routine? Because there could be other problems where this authentication routine is actually simply missing. And by just passing some inputs, you reach a program state where you are supposedly authenticated or where you can do something that is, is something that you shouldn't be able to do as a normal user, but there has never been an authentication routine in the first place. So that sort of problems with the previous model were you would have to know the authentication routine, the authentication routine would have to be present, and we need to be able to find path around that. So in order to change this, we decided, okay, let's, let's change the model a little bit and observe that it's often easy to find where those authenticated states are, when you have been successful in reaching an authenticated state. So that's easier than finding the authentication routine. And if we can find that, wouldn't it be great to say, okay, can I find statically, by just looking at the program, some inputs that allow me to drive that program to that success state. I don't care where the authentication routine is. I don't care if there's some bypass. I don't care if it's there at all. Can I have deterministic input? Can I determine the input just by looking at the program that allows me to drive the execution down to this authenticated success state? And if there is no bypass, then the answer should be no. The program itself doesn't tell you enough information because the bypass, uh, the, the, the authentication routine might you know, use some passwords that are stored somewhere else. However, if you actually have an authentication bypass, like a backdoor that has a string compare, then I can actually just look at the program and I can determine 
by looking at the program alone, what I need to pass to that program so that I drive it down to that success state. And then I can automatically find backdoors without even having to know the authentication routine. So we built this, and uh, you know, Jan will show you an example of how that works in a simple case. Um, and, and the only problem that is sort of left is how to model authentication bypass, um, or rather, sorry, how to find the success, the authenticated state. Um, we say it's easier to find, but how? Well, there are certain ways you can say, okay, if I have some ABI information, some system call information, I could say, okay, I'm accessing a particular program that only authenticated or trusted users should be able to do. I'm accessing certain operating system resources like files. But if I don't have that, then I have to say, okay, is the program printing out a certain string that says, hey, you are logged in, or hey, you are authenticated? Or does it touch certain parts of the program that I know are touching devices that it only authenticated users should touch? But if I can do that, if I can just find one point in a program where I can say, okay, here it's success, then our input determinism approach will just analyze the program and it will be able to find what inputs are needed from that program to drive it down to that state. And that allows us to find authentication bypass in a very generic way without actually knowing anything about the authentication routine in the first place. Okay, so, so basically what I've told you now are some, some of our security policies and security policy checkers. So the idea is, okay, you take a program, you have some policy that says, okay, this is authentication bypass that I don't want, or here's, here's my model of a memory corruption. And now the question is, how can I apply those security policies, or how can I check for those security policies in that binary program using our static analysis tools? And uh, this is when I hand it to Jan. He will talk about anger and our static analysis that allows us to find violations of these security policies and produce either reports or even proof of concepts. All right, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, as Chris mentioned, I will be talking about our awesome binary analysis framework called Anger. Uh, we're super excited about it. Hopefully, by the time this is over, you're super excited about it. You'll see uh, some good stuff. If uh, things get really exciting, you'll see some crashes of our stuff, maybe. But we'll see. All right, so uh, Anger um, has three main components. Uh, the first component is a binary loader. Uh, it doesn't sound too sexy, but a binary loader is uh, very necessary when you're dealing with firmware, right? It's often not clear, like Chris mentioned, where that firmware should be loaded in memory, uh, where the execution should begin, and so forth. Um, then we have a symbolic execution um, engine and a static analysis, uh, a bunch of static analysis routines. Uh, I'll talk about all of them, except for the binary loader, because, you know, I already mentioned that. But let's talk about the symbolic execution engine uh, first. So what is symbolic execution? Symbolic execution is a good way of figuring out how to trigger a certain path or a certain condition in the program. Uh, why would we want to do that? Um, it's not just for fun. Um, Recall the example of input determinism to identify uh, firmware uh, backdoors. Um, in this model, uh, we're really asking ourselves, uh, can we satisfy this path that uh, gets to the success state? Can we satisfy it with some uh, known input that we can uh, glean from the binary? Um, you might imagine that there are many ways of answering this question, so we might try first some of uh, the previous analysis techniques that Chris talked about. So we might try uh, dynamic analysis techniques. So you uh, pick a username and password and you try it. Did it work? Probably not. You try another one. Um, randomly guessing one of these is probably going to be pretty difficult. Uh, you might want to buy a couple lottery tickets, see how that goes. Um, so then you could move on to static analysis. Uh, Static analysis is too imprecise. It'll tell you that, yeah, maybe you can. There might be a data flow or a path flow to the success state. Great. Um, but it doesn't provide these sort of actionable inputs. Um, so we need something slightly different. So we go um, into symbolic execution. Uh, symbolic execution is, of course, a known technique. Uh, Anger uh, implements uh, dynamic symbolic execution uh, based on improvements off of various other uh, 
platforms. Um, but the basic idea is first we interpret the application. And we interpret the application by uh, modeling any user input as a symbolic variable. So over here you see a program that might read in four bytes, right? So let's say it reads in an int. Um, that int coming from user input is modeled as a symbolic variable x. It's not 10, it's not 0, it's not uh, 1337, it's x. Um, and as the program branches, we track constraints on uh, this input. So if uh, a certain path requires x to be between 10 and 100, uh, we note that down. And when the required condition is triggered or the required path is pa found, uh, we then do what's called a concretization step to convert the symbolic uh, set of constraints to a real um, input. So what does that look like? Uh, we have our set of constraints from that branch. And if you want to take that branch, if you want to satisfy that state of constraints, uh, we do a concretization step using a constraint solver, such as Z3 or a number of others, and uh, we get back a possible value. This constraint solving is uh, pretty tricky. It's an NP complete problem uh, in general, uh, so it's one of the kind of complications of symbolic execution that you, know, you might start a constraint solve and then you might you know, starve to death while waiting for it to finish. Um, but luckily, there are established libraries we leverage uh, for this. Um, so given that you know, we do symbolic execution, you're, I'm sure, chomping at the bit to see it happen. So we have a uh, binary um, that implements kind of an example model of this uh, backdoor uh, that we want to find. So this binary, it's an ARM binary here, uh, it asks for a username, password, calls an authentication routine. If the authentication routine returns zero, then it rejects the user, otherwise it accepts the user. The sneaky thing is that this authentication routine has a back door, and that's right here. This back door string compares the password against some uh, hard-coded string, and if it's true, it says the authenticated uh, variable to one. So uh, this binary has a back door. So let's see what it happens when we try to find this back door in this binary. So here is the GUI for anger. We call it anger management. <laughs> Um, the GUI uh, opens up and uh, begins symbolic execution at the entry point to the program. So this is the entry point to the program uh, even before main. Um, so we can see what is um, the output uh, or what is the um, output of the program so far. There is so far no output here. Um, so let's uh, step until we see a branch with symbolic execution. So we see a, a set of constraints on a uh, conditional branch, on an if statement, where we could come up with input to satisfy both sides of it. So we step it until it branches. And here we have, um, we see the binary asking the username, or asking the uh, user for a password and a username. So if you look at as well as the uh, input, we look at the out, uh, as well as the output, we look at the input, see what happened. Um, we see that it branched here on the uh, password so sneaky. So in order to uh, satisfy this path, the password needs to be so sneaky. In order to satisfy this path, the password can be anything except for so sneaky. Um, if we keep stepping, we'll see that uh, the so sneaky path says welcome to the admin console. So there's our back door, um, found using symbolic execution, which produces an actionable input and matches our uh, security policy. So this is great. Um, I mean, this is awesome. Why don't we just use symbolic execution for everything ever and uh, be done with it? Well, I'll show you why. Um, this binary, of course, is quite simple. Um, but if we look at a more complicated binary, let's say bash. I like bash. I, you know, it was my programming language of choice for a little while. Um, but if we try to symbolically analyze bash, we'll see something interesting happen. So let's step until bash forks. 
are not forks, but until we have two possible paths. Um, and let's keep going. Let's, let's see what happens. If we keep going, we have three possible paths now. Now we have like five or six. Now we have quite a bit more. And as we zoom out, we can see that if we keep stepping, the amount of uh, possible paths is not sustainable to, to track. Um, so, and if I keep stepping, this will keep growing and growing. And if I sit here and hammer on this button, my laptop will run out of RAM and we'll have another technical situation like at the beginning of the uh, presentation. But what's worse is you can see that with all of this branching, um, Bash is branching on the, the input that you provide. So um, the uh, command line parameters, standard input, and so forth. But if you look, even with so many states here, in, in, in Bash already, if we output what Bash has outputted so far, and relay that graph, we zoom in, we'll see that even with all of these uh, paths, Bash still hasn't even printed anything, right? So this is a symbolic exploration undergoing a path explosion inside like initialization code of Bash. And this is why symbolic exploration alone is a uh, not feasible approach for um, this sort of uh, vetting for, for uh, backdoors and vulnerabilities. Uh, at least not, uh, not alone. Um, so what can we do? Um, of course, we want to use symbolic ex execution because uh, it's very precise. Once it tells us there's a back door, it can give us an input to trigger that back door. Um, and, uh, you know, the, those inputs are immediately actionable. Um, it's very flexible, but unfortunately, it's just not scalable on its own the, because of the path explosion problem that we just saw and because constraint solving is uh, tricky. So if you saw sometimes when I clicked, it would sit for a while. I was solving a particularly tough set of constraints in the background. Um, so, uh, and, and furthermore, we have our case that's very simple, our back door. But as we saw in a real program with Bash, um, things go kind of badly. And in fact, a real backdoor might be buried in an authentication routine that's in a real program, right? Or that's in a real uh, binary and has a control flow that is kind of crazy. And uh, we might not even get to the backdoor, might be in that red square, we might not even get there because of a path explosion. We'll run out of resources, never reach it. So what do we do? Well, in Anger, we uh, provide a bunch of static analysis routines that we can use to guide symbolic execution and uh, keep it feasible to detect these back doors. Um, specifically, we uh, provide uh, two main uh, types of analyses uh, based on a really cool um, technique called value set analysis. Um, we have a control flow graph. Um, so Anger's control flow graph isn't uh, like Ida's control flow graph in the sense that it just shows you, you know, direct jumps and some heuristically recovered jumps. It attempts to be extremely complete. We try to resolve uh, indirect jumps, um, calls through function pointers, uh, all sorts of um, hard to analyze uh, control flow transitions to attempt to create a very complete control flow graph for other analyses. On top of that, we do a data flow analysis. So once we identify the um, successfully authenticated point, we um, use a data flow analysis to determine a small slice of the program that we can execute instead of the entire firmware to analyze just the authentication routine. And this is all uh, powered, like I said, by value set analysis. So let's dive into value set analysis real quick. Um, value set analysis is very useful at telling us things that symbolic execution is not good at um, or that, you know, uh, that other static analyses might not be very good at. Um, so give, take this example. This is a, a simple loop that looks through an array for the value uh, 1337. And we want to know, at the end of this loop, what is the value in RBX, right? Uh, and RBX is, of course, the uh, loop counter in this example. So um, symbolic exploration, uh, 
undergoes a state explosion here. At every loop, it uh, spawns off a path that exits the loop and one that doesn't. First time, uh, it says, okay, is, did we find one, three, seven? Maybe, right? So it, it spawns off two paths, one which did, one which didn't. By the end of this, you'll have 1024 paths. Um, and of course, then every other uh, part of your program will then, uh, every other part of your analysis will uh, explode by that much. So we could do some naive static analysis, which tells us RBX can be anything. That's precise, I mean, that's uh, uh, correct, uh, but it's not precise, right? Um, we could improve the precision with a range analysis that tells us RBX is less than OX1024. OX1024, for some reason, is the size of this uh, buffer. Uh, we can see it right here. Um, so then, you know, we have a question, can we do better? And the answer is uh, yes. Uh, we can use value set analysis. Value set analysis is a really complex uh, analysis that does quite a lot of uh, complicated things, but let's dive into a specific uh, part of it. Um, we look at strided intervals in value set analysis. A strided interval represents a set of values. A strided interval in value set analysis is the, the equivalent of a symbolic execution symbolic variable. Right, so when we had x before and then we had constraints on x, strider variable is the static uh, analysis equivalent of that in this case. So this strider interval here um, has a low value of OX100, a high value of OX120, size of 32 bytes, and a stride of four. So the stride of four means that it can take any value at intervals of four between OX100 and OX120. So how does this um, help us, right? So let's look at how we'd analyze that example with uh, value set analysis. We start out at uh, program position one here where we just initialize RBX. RBX is now a stride interval between zero and zero with a stride of one. Great. So then we go through the loop once, right? So um, as we go through the loop, we merge the, uh, at, at the loop, back at the loop header, we merge the value of RBX with its previous value. So when we merge those uh, stride intervals, we get a stride interval that could be zero or four. That's a uh, range of uh, between zero and four with a stride of four, two values. We go through it again. Uh, we merge it, it can have three values, 0, 4, and 8, then 0, 4, and C, and finally, we hit the limit of our patience, we say screw it, and we do a widening operation, right? So in order to keep this feasible, we have a loop limiter after which we widen. So we say, okay, now it can be between 0 and infinity, but it's still that stride of 4. We know it's a stride of 4, um, which is interesting because we didn't know that in any of the other analyses. But further on, we can then do a narrowing operation. We analyze it again, and we see, oh, okay, that maximum uh, was 1024. And that allows us to get out of the loop into RBX, and now we know that RBX can be between 0 and OX1024 with a stride of 4. This is more information than our range analysis told us, and it's specifically critical because, uh, for example, if RBX is then used as an entry into a jump table, we know that the jump table has addresses starting every four bytes, which is critical for resolving indirect jumps through jump tables. Um, so that's anger. Uh, I, I've talked about the um, different components, different analyses we have in it. Uh, some of them, there's more of course. Um, but what did we use it for? Well, one of the things we use it for other than backdoors and firmware is the DARPA CyberGrand Challenge. Uh, as I said, the CyberGrand Challenge is a uh, contest to build an autonomous hacking platform that uh, can hack and patch vulnerabilities. Shellfish uh, participated um, as a bunch of uh, grad students out of uh, UC Santa Barbara. If you guys think your uh, company's code is uh, kind of crazy, you should see what 11 grad students um, hobbled together in their spare time with uh, very little oversight. It's pretty crazy. But we used it, we created a cyber reasoning system um, which uh, did a lot of stuff including um, scanning for vulnerabilities and patching the vulnerabilities. And both of those uh, used as one of their main components, anger. So this system is uh, pretty uh, uh, powerful and actually very usable. Uh, we used it to qualify for the CGC uh, and win a fair chunk of change for uh, shellfish. So it was pretty awesome. Um, so 
we made Anger so that anyone could use it, not just us. You use it for MyPython. Um, you can access its analyses in a well-encapsulated, very usable way, lots of buzzwords. Um, and moreover, we made our architecture independent. You saw me analyze an ARM binary. Uh, CGC was x86. We actually support the 64-bit and 32-bit uh, variants of every major architecture, um, MIPS, ARM, PPC, x86. Uh, we use VEX as our internal representation, which allows us uh, to do that. VEX is what Valgrind uses, which is how your Valgrind mem checks work. Um, so uh, Anger, as I said, super easy to use. Here's uh, on the top there, we can generate and display a control flow graph for a binary in four lines of Python. Uh, that's including importing Anger and loading the binary. Um, and on the bottom, we can uh, carry out symbolic execution uh, super simply as well. Uh, of course, it's up to you to make sure it doesn't explode and so forth, but the uh, core analyses are exposed very readily. And what's more, Anger is open source. So as of right now, as of this talk, we open sourced Anger. You can find it on GitHub. You can hit up our website, anger.io, as long as uh, they got the internet working enough to update the website. Um, and you can subscribe to our mailing list. Um, Anger represents uh, almost two years of work. This is our baby. Uh, the line numbers are almost 60,000. It's a gigantic project, all Python, a uh, tiny bit of a C stub uh, in, in one place. Um, and there are about 6,000 commits. I mean, this is a pretty crazy uh, undertaking. Uh, and we hope that open sourcing this will kind of launch the next generation of binary analysis um, that we'd love to uh, collaborate with everyone to uh, improve our capabilities in this field, uh, as in the community's capabilities. So check out Anger. Uh, star us, of course, on GitHub. That goes without saying. Um, and uh, issues, pull requests, everything's welcome. Um, shoot us an email. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, questions? Um, please step up to the microphone and uh, let us know. Someone has to ask like uh, some question. You got it, go. Oh. Ah, uh, we have a microphone situation. Oh, okay. Ah, really? Hi. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, I, I just noticed that when you're analyzing, I may have gotten this wrong or mistaken it, but when you're analyzing it, it seems like you're going from the start to the end to find the success or the success path. Is there, is it much easier to do that? Because it seems that the paths are going to really be yes. explosive, that's what, that's what you mentioned. But what if you go from the success path when you go backwards and to find the success so path? That's, that's is that harder? That's the full approach, um, but we don't have really a, a visual GUI for it, right? So the full approach is, of course, identify that success path, um, calculate the data dependency graph, and then slice backwards, and then execute just that slice. Um, that's much harder to visualize. Um, so right now, our, our GUI supports some, uh, some static analyses, mostly in terms of grabbing the control flow uh, graph, and then it supports this symbolic exploration. Um, what we did for the paper, for example, is implement this uh, ex exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So, what do, you, what do you guys use for resolving function pointers? Um, we use so we use uh, value set analysis for. Uh, I mean, we use a whole bunch of techniques. So the CFG code you can check it out. It's several thousand lines long of complete insanity. The guy that wrote it is sitting over there laughing right now. Um, so we use uh, a lot of stuff, um, depending on the function pointer. So if it's, for example, um, something that's in a global struct somewhere, right? We might use uh, value set analysis to identify the possible ranges of uh, where the pointer can uh, point to and then you know, jump there. Um, if it's something that is computed on the fly, 
Uh, in certain cases, we have to resort to slicing backwards from the jump and symbolically executing that slice to determine the jump target. So uh, there, there are several of these uh, different types of operations that we can carry out to resolve as many of these uh, indirect pointers as possible. Okay. I, I guess my question really was like what kind of points to analysis do you do? Uh, it's a more of a fish question. Okay. But yeah, um, I'd love to talk to you offline with uh, uh, the other guys. We see that we have to wrap it up, right? Or, or we have to them? Okay, so we'll still take a few questions and otherwise we'll just continue to talk to you guys on the outside. So, go ahead. Did you publish this paper on this tour? On, on, so, the paper is Firm Alice. Um, it was published at NGSS in February. Can I have a title? I'm sorry? Can I have your paper title? Firm Alice. Okay. F I R M A L I C E. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Type for one more? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in your binary loader. Do you have some nice heuristics uh, that can detect like a Linux kernel or VxWorks, something like that, that can guess uh, loading addresses, uh, images uh, in the mem yeah, in we, memory? We uh, detect loading addresses, um, and then we have some analyses um, that identify, try to identify like uh, start points, uh, like where, where execution might be able to start. Um, but the, the loading uh, address detection is fairly robust. It uses a bunch of different like jump tables, global memory access, try to figure out where the binary needs to go. So it even works sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it works. <laughs> it, it happens. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, does it work with polymorphic code, or can you extend it to do this? Uh, with what? Polym so code that changes itself. Uh, so we have never tested it with polymorphic code, but when we lift um, bytes, out, like to to translate and analyze, we lift them from the running state. Uh, I'd have to see if that's the default, but we, we have that ability. Um, so. I, I, I want to say yes. It should. It should be able to. There's nothing fundamental stopping it. But uh, I'm sure that the first time you try it, something will go horribly wrong. But try it. Open an issue. It'll be interesting to see. Thanks. Thanks. Last question over there. Okay. So, uh, which uh, solver did you use for the symbolic execution tool? We use Z3. Z3. Um, yeah. So we we uh, released. Uh, uh, Anger has a bunch of different uh, components, has like six or seven repositories. Um, you can check it out. Um, but we have one that's a uh, abstraction layer over Z3 and uh, domain supporting value set analysis. So we could have this kind of unified interface to them. But for solving, we use Z3. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. <laughs>